Good morning. Can you hear me in the back? Yes? Okay, great. So, um, following his enlightenment, Master Sotisan read the Diamond Sutra and declared, Buddha Dharma comprises the supreme way among all religions under heaven. It illuminates the principle of the nature, solves the critical issue of birth and death, elucidates the karmic principle of cause and effect, and formulates the path of practice. A couple of weeks ago, during a question and answer session here at the One Dharma Center, the Venerable Juxanim explained that in the Diamond Sutra, as the Buddha answers his disciples to Buddhist questions, he is describing the different levels of the mind as it progresses towards enlightenment. There are moments in life when things seem to fall apart, and others when the pieces of the puzzle seem to fall back into place. Sometimes, when things move fast, it seems like the puzzle blows into smithereens and then falls back into place in a matter of days, maybe hours, and at times during one sitting meditation. Because in truth, what we see as our reality is refracted through the prism of our emotions. And the closer we get to being able to understand that phenomenon, the shiftier it all seems to become till perhaps the day or the moment when we finish piercing the veil or cutting through the illusion. One day, back in 1982, I opened my eyes after finishing a ritual and everything had changed. The world had become utterly beautiful. I felt an immense inner happiness that radiated from my belly, and I loved every single person, regardless of who they were. It was as if a switch had been turned on the moment my eyes opened and happiness reigned. That lasted several months, four or five, but it began to fall apart because I could not negotiate my new sense of be being with the reality of my everyday life. I didn't have a true understanding of what was happening to me, and perhaps for that very reason, the people around me reacted to me with irritation and befuddlement. I began to try to protect what I felt, made a series of mistakes, and my life fell apart. But once you've had that kind of an experience, you know. It may take your whole life to find it again, but you know it is there, so you never, in fact, you cannot give up. Other lesser realizations came and went, via a new practice or a new book, and again, did not last. So slowly, I became to understand that for anything to last, I would have to build it brick by brick. It would have to come with a foundation and a knowledge that would make it stick together, and I would need to be able to communicate with other people so that my happiness and my understanding would bring me closer to them instead of further apart. In other words, I needed a community of like-minded people to foment and cement those experiences. I'm a voracious reader, but I had not gone to the source and read the sutras. Back in 2013, when I joined the One Dharma Center, I read the Heart Sutra, and things began to move faster. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. I carried the beauty of that sense like a mantra, and I still do. The very first time I meditated, back in 1974, I received a mantra from a young teacher in an improvised TM center in Berkeley, California. Inside a little curtain cell, she briefly explained the technique and we sat to meditate for 20 minutes. And 
at some point during that meditation, I went somewhere else where time and space ceased to exist and then suddenly came back, wondering where I had been and for how long. I continued the session as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. I did not ask the young instructor any questions because I did not know how to articulate or reference what I had just experienced. For about a year following that meditation, I entered the void every time I sat down to meditate, which was twice a day. Then it tapered off. Emptiness is form, and form is emptiness. I understand, not of course with my intellect, but through my experiences. On Memorial Day weekend in 2014, I attended the retreat here at the Wandama Center. Sunday night, after evening meditation, Reverend Do Sung Yu gave the Dharma talk and spoke about what to me had become the focus of the retreat, the emptiness of body and mind, that entity that we call I. I listened intently while curiously the air in this meditation hall became rarefied. And as I watched Reverend Yu give a surprisingly simple explanation on the subject, he seemed to begin to vanish in front of my eyes and I could see what was behind him instead of his body. But I could still hear his voice. Then, along with him, I disappeared too. It was an all-encompassing experience, as if I was seeing everything from a wide, detached, and weightless point of view, with absolute certainty. Coming back to the real world of form was, of course, the opposite, unsettling and confusing. And again, I didn't feel I could communicate to anyone else what I had experienced. I went to my room and cried because without this I of mine, how was I going to be able to mediate with the world? I left the retreat early. But I was hooked on the sutras. The next one I read was the Diamond Sutra. I stayed home alone on a summer afternoon. I read it online and I cried. I don't know how many of you have read the Diamond Sutra. For me, it is, without a doubt, the most beautiful thing I have ever read in my life. Subhuti asks the Buddha what a good person must do, must do to reach enlightenment. The Buddha answers what I believe to be the core of the teaching, which I would like to read to you. The Buddha said to Subhuti, this is how the Bodhisattva Mahasattvas master their thinking. However many species of living beings there are, whether they are born from eggs, from wombs, from moisture, or spontaneously, whether they have form or do not have form, whether they have perceptions or do not have perceptions, or we must lead all of them to the ultimate nirvana, so they can be liberated. And when all this immeasurable, innumerable, infinite number of beings has been liberated, we do not, in truth, think that a single being has been liberated. Well, I found this not just intriguing, but also filled with a great cosmic sense of humor. But allow me to read what the Buddha says in the next short paragraph. Why is this so? If Subhuti, a bodhisattva, holds onto the idea that a self, a person, a living being, or a lifespan exists, that person is not an authentic bodhisattva. I read this and I was stirred very deeply. As intriguing and seemingly contradictory as these two passages seemed, they rang very true to me. 
And as I was about to find out, these words would grow like seeds during ensuing meditations. So very much is said in these two short paragraphs. For example, that regardless of their differing natures, all beings matter the same, and we must lead them all to nirvana if we ourselves want to reach the highest state of mind, the realized, awakened mind. But why is that? And here is where I think the whole of the teaching lies. Because we are all one thing, one being. How many of us have been perpetually mesmerized by this idea that we're all one thing? How difficult is it to grasp it, even if we can get glimpses into it from something we've read or heard, or more importantly, from insights we arrive at through our own meditation practice? But it tends to remain a shrouded mystery that resists any attempt at being reduced to a cohesive idea. Sometime that same year, I began to seriously study the Diamond Sutra. Then I decided to translate it into Spanish, my first language, so that I could delve more profoundly into it and at the same time be able to make it accessible to some of the people I know and love who have less facility with the English language. I could see clearly that the Buddha spends much of the Diamond Sutra expanding our minds. He says, for example, that a person who can read and understand the Sutra without being taken over by feelings of terror and fear is indeed a rare person. And that the Tathagata, which is how the Buddha calls himself, sees and knows that person. Rare honor indeed. But why does he speak of terror? The Buddha spends many verses going over the idea of the innumerable and the immeasurable. He says, for example, Subhuti, if there were as many Ganges rivers as the number of grains of sand in the Ganges, would you say that the number of grains of sand in all those Ganges rivers is very many? Subhuti replied, very many, indeed, world-honored one. If the number of Ganges rivers were huge, how many more so the number of grains of sand in all those Ganges rivers? Subhuti, now I want to ask you this. If a good person were to fill all the 3,000 countless universes with as many precious jewels as the number of grains of sand in all the Ganges rivers, as an act of generosity, would that person bring much happiness by her virtuous act? Subhuti replied, very much, world-honored one. The Buddha said to Subhuti, if a good person knows how to accept, practice, and explain this sutra to others, even if it is a verse of four lines, the happiness that results from this virtuous act would be far greater. There is such playful beauty in these passages. I would like to note that I counted 10 times in a span of 12 pages where the Buddha gives as a variation of the innumerable or immeasurable happiness that this sutra will provide. But let's look a little deeper into why reading the sutra could at the same time create fear. The Buddha continues, Subhuti, the happiness resulting from the virtuous act of a good person who receives, recites, studies, and practices the sutra in the last epoch will be so great that if I were to explain it in detail now, some people would become suspicious and disbelieving, and their minds might become disoriented. From what I can see, what the Buddha is doing is stretching our minds beyond their usual boundaries. 
The reading and studying of the sutra is actually a workout for our mind's muscles to stretch them into expansionsly, expansions previously unknown to them so that we can begin to glimpse the truth of who we are, the true reality of our mind that is veiled to us while we remain in the realm of language, which is the realm of our consciousness. Why? Because in this, our so-called reality, in order for us to communicate with each other, we need symbols, signifiers, which are what words are. Words stand in for what the true reality is, and by the very act of standing in for truth, signifiers or words are limiting. They are only a representation of the truth, and therefore incomplete. So it is the Buddha says to Subhuti in the Diamond Sutra, in a place where things are discerned by signifiers, in that place there is deception. And he goes on to say, if you can see the signless nature of signifiers, then you can see the Tathagata. When we let go of signifiers and their limiting influence, we allow our minds to expand to the boundless. And it is the vastness of that limitless space that brings, along with the first glimpses of the true nature of our reality, the possible feeling of terror or fear. So the Buddha says elsewhere, you need faith in the Buddha in order to enter the vast ocean of Dharma. And it is so very true. But let us not allow fear to stop us, because the promised happiness begins to result pretty quickly as we enter the ocean of the Diamond Sutra. But let us, sorry, meditation can deliver many of the great comes, of the concepts and experiences we may have read or heard about, like, for example, the view, which can one day just suddenly shift into place when things and then things look objective, our emotions do not disturb us, our thoughts pass by, and we see things for what they really are. So one day, we may suddenly begin to look inside and understand what it means when we read or hear that we can shine the light inward, because there truly is a whole universe inside of us. Or another day, something kind of turns on this inner place where there is peace, where we can arrive at will and always find happiness. The moment we seek a quiet place away from the activities of the world and concentrate. But most important of all is the moment when looking inward we find a vast body of light and we understand that that is all there is, this light that we are made of, that it is all made of, and that it is something that cannot be broken up into pieces any more than the light in the sky can be cut up into morsels, and that we are, lo and behold, actually are all one, not just us people, but all all beings, all things. And we can revel in that reality that we are, or that it is, all just one expanded, everlasting Om. In my case, it seemed coincidental that this one Dharma Center had appeared seemingly out of nowhere, practically in my backyard, just as I was getting more and more involved in the practice. Then, one summer day, my daughter came from the city to do a self-retreat and came back home with a gift for me, a Reverend Yu's lucid book, Thunder's Silence. I received it as I had become more and more involved in my study of the Diamond Sutra, and as my subsequent meditations were rewarding me with experiences I did not know quite how to process. 
And voila, as I deepened into the thunderous silence reading, I began to find descriptions and explanations for the insights and experiences in my meditations, including the one I had had during the Memorial Day weekend, the sense of the disappearing of the body, which made me leave the retreat early because I did not know how to begin to explain to anyone what I had just experienced. So it is that whether we call it the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, or as it is sometimes simply referred to, meditation, the scriptures, and the community, or as I once heard the Dalai Lama call it, meditation, working out our afflicted emotions and active compassion. It is truly important to take the three jewels seriously because we can spend our lives, this one and many others, jumping from experience to insight to steps of enlightenment without being able to assemble it all into the true path towards nirvana. Instead, let us walk together on that path to nirvana, and when fear arises, let us remember that like any other emotion, thought, or event in this world of form, it too shall pass. And let us return to that boundless, eternal, joyous Om inside. Towards the end of the Diamond Sutra, the Buddha gives us instructions on how to explain this sutra to others. He says, without attachment to signifiers, seeing things for what they are, with the mind unengaged. Why? All conditioned things are like dreams, shadows, bubbles in a stream, dewdrops, a lightning flash in a summer cloud. Contemplate them thus. Thank you.